Hello and welcome to Live Wire Markets. My name is Chris Conway. Today I'm joined by Guy Keller, who runs the Tribeca Nuclear Opportunities Fund. Guy has been investing in commodities for the best part of 25 years, having started his career at Macquarie Bank. Guy, welcome. Thanks for having me, Chris. Guy, the World Nuclear Association just put out its latest report talking about supply and demand and modelling it out to 2040. Some interesting insights from that. Can you talk us through those and what you were seeing out of that report? Yeah, I've got to say I love that report. Um, I mean, it's the World Nuclear Association. They have unprecedented access to um, every consumer of uranium products through civilian nuclear. Uh, they also have access to all of the wannabe producers and producers. So they get a really, really good idea of what's going to be coming to the market from supply, but also demand. And, and um, uranium is one of those commodities where it's, it's relatively easy to model because just the long-term nature of, of, the, uh, of nuclear energy um, electricity provision means that uh, these utilities are thinking 5, 10, 15 years out. So one of the findings out of that report, Guy, was that there's potentially a massive undersupply out to 2040. Is that one of the thing that's, things that has you excited about this space? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, they run three scenarios of demand. Their reference scenario, which is uh, what would be expected in, uh, if, if nothing was to really change. Their lower scenario, if, uh, if there was to be less demand for whatever reason, uh, either less reactors being built, and their upper, which is, uh, you know, if everything goes right. And the supply that the World Nuclear Association models cannot even, it barely is able to meet the requirements of the lowest demand scenario. Right. I mean, it's just incredible. And when you, when you look at that, that chart and what they look at, it's hard enough to keep mines that are currently producing to produce. It's, it's hard enough to bring uh, idle assets back online and it's hard enough to develop assets. The WNA also assumes planned and prospective mines are going to fill that gap just to the lower. Uh, and I've looked at that list. Uh, there's some pretty interesting projects that need to do a lot to actually come to market right. to meet that. And then we've got what they call unspecified supply, uh, which is they know that supply needs to come from somewhere, but they don't know where it's going to come from yet. And as I said, this is a body that looks at everything globally out to 2040, and they can't sort of put a handle on, uh, on where, that, where that supply is going to come from. So if there's not enough supply and there's massive demand, what happens to prices? It's economics 101, right? Oh, absolutely, and that's what we're seeing at the moment. Right. Um, Guy, you brought along a chart comparing some of the dynamics in the lithium market. We know how hot lithium has been, but comparing that market to the uranium market, can you just talk us through that chart and what you're seeing and why it's important? Yeah, I mean, so we've seen since 2017, we've seen a 300 odd percent rally in the price of uranium, and, and some of those uranium stocks have rallied sort of a thousand odd percent. And, and you're already getting uh, analysts in the market saying we're done, we're overvalued, uh, we've, we've, we've gone far enough. And I looked at that and I said why? Uh, and I talk about last cycle, we had an 1800% rally in the, in the spot price, but more importantly, there was long term contracting done at $110 a pound. Here we are at 70 odd now with a 65 odd uh, contract price. Um, and so I th sort of thought to myself, we talk about last cycle and, and people sort of shrug and say, you know, whatever. So I thought, well, what's another sector I can compare it to? Lithium. When you look at the lows of spodumene price in 2020, it rallied 1,500 odd percent. We had some eye-watering rallies in some of these stocks. Uh, I mean, Pilbara Resources, one of the larger cap stocks, rallied 4,000 uh, percent. Some of the developers, 12 to 14,000 percent. And I said, you know, whilst that's not necessarily an indication of what, what will happen in uranium, the point I'm making is that happened in lithium and no one was saying it's overvalued. Everyone said, well, it's required, it's, it's necessary. Yeah. I then went and had a look at, at the differences in the market and say, well, why is it necessary? They're both critical or essential minerals for decarbonisation, uranium more so for energy security. Lithium, we started that market with relatively unknown demand and relatively unknown supply. You know, 2015, 16, the Chinese built out capacity very quickly. We've, we had some supply response that bottlenecked, uh, and that's how we saw the lows. We're now relying on future gigafactories to be built to give us a supply deficit in lithium. Uranium, we started coming off the bottom with a 10-year primary mine supply deficit. So the existing demand was already consuming more than was being mined. We've seen a number of changes where some of that natural decay and demand has, has now even back up, so it's staying on. And we've got one of the biggest reactor build programs in decades. So giving us an even bigger demand, uh, the supply deficit. And so I sit here and say, why are we done in uranium? Um, you know, there's no wall of supply that's come on. Um, you know, there's plenty more we can elaborate on that story as well. 
Well, no, let's dig into it a little bit because I think this is important. And, and one of the follow-up questions I wanted to ask you is, you know, is the opportunity still available for investors? Now, obviously, we're here talking about it today. Yep. So I imagine that you're going to say, yes, it is. But what does that opportunity look like? Um, and what do you think some of the things or some of the catalysts might be to start seeing the movement in the share prices? Yeah, so, I mean, as I said, you know, there was always that sort of view that when the price rallied, there'd be a supply response. And, and again, when you compare back to lithium, you saw a bit of that supply response when the price moved, but the real supply response came when the, the battery makers, the OEMs, the car manufacturers, all worked out that writing a piece of paper saying, I've got an MOU to buy your, buy your um, lithium when you, when you get into production, is not worth the paper it's written on if you can't fund yourself to production. So they very quickly pivoted and, and prepaid debt finance project stakes in these lithium suppliers. So you had that supply was able to, to fund itself. Uranium's back in last cycle. You've got utilities saying, I'm going to write a contract, a future starting contract, where the terms of those contracts are anonymous, are confidential. The buyer's anonymous, but I'll let you tell, you, tell, tell your market how many pounds, and you go and find the money to, to fund yourself into production. And this is where we're at right now. There's a lot of developers who, who are sitting there going, well, I, 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 the money's not here yet. <laughs> so you haven't had that big supply response. And, and I still don't believe you'll get it because we don't have mega projects like last cycle. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. So hence, that's why I still think there's opportunity. Fantastic. Last time we spoke, you suggested the floor price for uranium was around $75 per pound. Yep. As you were saying earlier, it's around that mark now. Mm -hmm. What happens next, Guy? What, what price forecast have you got for us now? Well, I mean, this is what we're, uh, this is the interesting thing we're seeing. I mean, people are saying, you know, we were at 60, we thought it would come on there, now we're at 75, that's where we thought it would come on. But, uh, you know, again, um, what we're working out is that price is not the only piece of the, of the ingredient that needs to go in to bake the cake. Right. Um, you know, you need permitting, you need community, you need uh, capex, you need a management team. <laughs> and so you're finding a lot of these developers are now sort of sitting there going, oh, we're doing another study. Uh, we're not quite there yet. Or we, we don't quite have that permit that we, we thought we might have had. So you're not, you know, like just because the price is here doesn't mean necessarily. So, you know, where does it need to get to? Um, you know, as I said, last cycle there was contracting done at $110 a pound uh, and it didn't send any utility broke. Um, you know, I don't think price is necessarily that important. Um, it's going to be who can navigate the labyrinth of, of things that the other things they need to do to get, their, to get their project ready to make a final investment decision. And then who can supply, who can then get either the equity or the debt to then fund it. Right. Just so just to follow up there, again, I remember last time we spoke, you said there was about 50 opportunities or companies that you were seriously looking back, yep. looking at that are operating in, that, in this space. That's down from 500 the last cycle. Yep. So where are we at now? Are there more players coming online? You talked about some of them struggling to get some of those ancillary pieces, the puzzle to put it together. Yeah. But what are you seeing happening on the ground? Yeah, what I'm seeing is, is a lot of interest to bring last cycle projects back into the market, either out of private hands or, or, uh, or spinning them out from uh, other listed companies who just a portfolio asset. But the, the macro environment and, and the investor nervousness is, is not giving them the courage to do that at the moment. So, you know, I thought there'd be more coming through. In fact, what we've seen is we've probably seen the number shrink a little bit because we've seen some mergers. We've seen some of these smaller cap companies decide to do script deals to, to get themselves bigger and a bit more relevant uh, and to have a bit more bang in the buck and, uh, and attract a bit more investor attention. So, you know, do we get to 500 again? We probably do at some stage. Right. <laughs> Let's talk companies. Let's talk one or two that you're big on right now and that you have significant positions in the portfolio. 70% of my, of my portfolio is actually offshore. Um, and that's because uh, there's plenty of opportunity in the US and, and Canada. Uh, it's a very mature market over there. They, they understand the nuclear thesis, whereas Australian investors tend to look at uranium as another commodity. Sure. Um, but from an ASX perspective, there's actually, uh, you know, given that's where most of your, your listeners are probably uh, uh, investing, but there's, there's actually quite a good cross-section of opportunity. I mean, you can have, uh, you know, NextGen, one of the biggest development projects in the Athabasca Basin is listed on the ASX. It's not that liquid, but, you know, there's some, some serious leverage there. You've got two of the, uh, the projects coming to market near term being Boss Energy and Paladin Resources, or Paladin Energy now. Um, you know, they're both on the ASX. 
then you can invest in, in Namibia, you can invest in the Athabasca. I mean, you can go down to about a five or six million dollar market cap if you really want to get down to the weeds. Um, but, but right now, I think, you know, when I look at where investors want to be, and we're seeing it across resources everywhere, they want to be in the larger cap, more liquid things. You know, the, the money tends to be at the moment in the Boss Paladins, the Deep Yellow, they're all in the small ordinaries index, so small cap guys are on them. Um, and there's a trickle down effect. But, uh, and then of course, those who can, uh, you know, maybe get that Canadian line of next gen and bring it over to Australia are, are getting their leverage there because I mean, that's a world-class project. I know when you're looking at companies, Guy, yep. you like them to be at a certain stage of their life cycle. Can you just talk uh, the viewers through what's part of that cycle you like them to be in and why? At the moment, I'm sort of a little bit light on the developers who the market were expecting to be a lot closer to production now they were at $75. Yeah. Um, and because we're not a mature sector, like a gold or, or where, you know, we're seeing cost inflation coming through numbers everywhere in every mining project. The difference is, I think, in uranium, because it's less covered, it's a bit more of a surprise to investors sometimes when a developer comes out and says, oh, my capex has gone from 300 to 450, and everyone goes, wait, what? Um, whereas with gold, it's flagged, you know, like there's plenty of analysts covering it. So I'm sort of a little bit light there because uh, there has been a trend of sell that news. Uh, and so it has given me an opportunity to, to get stocks at a better price uh, once that news is digested. Obviously, those funded into production, they become more relevant to, as I said, small cap analysts who can then model cash flow. So it becomes interesting to them. So I'm a little bit heavier there. And of course, you know, we like to be in the weeds, so there's plenty of those explorer and developer type things uh, or pre-IPOs, there's not many pre-IPOs recently, but there's a few in the wings, um, where you can really get in early, ahead of the market, ahead of the brokers, uh, you know, alongside the management and, uh, and sort of work with them, generally on last cycle assets. So they're, so they're assets that I know have had drill holes in them, have had surveys done on them. And, uh, you know, surprise, surprise, these guys go and throw a drill rig in right next to a, an old hole from 20, 2008 and find uranium. So, you know, those sort of stories are, uh, are quite good as well. Fantastic. Guy, I want to talk uh, what's next for uranium. So small modular reactors, they were in the WNA report, they were yep. referenced there. Is that an exciting new area of demand, do you think? Yeah, I mean, it was great to see the WNA actually make an attempt to model that demand. And I think in their upper demand scenario, it's something like 68 million pounds a year out to 2040. Um, you know, that's out of a you know, 200 million pound market, so it's a substantial increase. The, the reality as well is, is that I think what, and so this is part of the reason we call ourselves nuclear energy opportunities and not a uranium miners fund, right. was that when we looked at the opportunity six years ago, one of the very first things we, we said was what technology might displace our thesis. Mm -hmm. Is there something that's going to come in over the top and, and, and make this dead in the water? And the answer actually, it actually was the small modular reactors. It was actually increasing uh, the demand thesis because uh, the technology was adding. And I think it's important to, to differentiate. There's two types of small modular reactors. There's existing technology that's going to be built on a smaller scale in factories to make it more affordable for utilities and other countries outside the big nuclear countries. That technology is already in circulation in the world in gigawatt style. Then you've got your advanced small modular reactors, which is your, you know, your terrors, molten salt, your fast breeder reactors, high temperature gas cooled, where the technology is out there, but it's not commercially proven. So the first ones, the smaller versions of the, of the bigger things or bigger operating, they'll be definitely a force to contend with. But more importantly, you've got government supporting them. Right. United States government throwing you know, hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars at it. The Canadian government's doing it. Uh, the UK government's got a, an SMR race uh, that with uh, Rolls-Royce being their champion there. Uh, the Koreans are doing it, the, the Chinese are doing it, the Russians are doing it. So it's not just commercial interests relying on the market uh, to, to give them money. It's government saying, here's a check, go out and, and get these things built. Go and sign some MOUs with, with some utilities to, so you can prove that there's a, a product there for you. So, you know, it's still very early and we've got a very small position that we call nuclear innovation, just to remind investors that we're looking at it. Yep. Um, it hasn't necessarily done very much yet, <laughs> um, but, you know, there will be more of that technology and tech angle coming, which is going to be interesting to see if, if the tech investors sort of embrace that as, as oh yeah, this is a, a really cool sort of tech angle at decarbonising the world. We'll see. 
Guy, I've got to ask you a follow-up question there. Just as you were listing all those countries, and I don't want this to get political, but what is the probability that we get nuclear reactors here in Australia, given we are a uranium-rich country? Well, the irony is we've already got a nuclear reactor in Australia. Lucas Heights Lucas here in Heights, Sydney, yeah. And, and, you know, before anybody jumps up and down about it, it saves tens of thousands of lives with the medical isotopes it produces out of that uh, medical reactor. So, I mean, this is the, the irony is that we have it. You know, there's certainly a push to uh, at least take the ban away. Uh, I'm a big believer that, that, that it should be down to commercial decisions, uh, that utilities should have the opportunity to explore it. Um, it, it will probably uh, happen eventually. The interesting thing is that, is that um, corporates are, are starting to jump up and down. We saw BHP not long ago say, we would look at micro-reactors for remote mine sites. Right. And you think about that, I mean, these. They're, they're, they're burning diesel, they're trying to put solar panels out, but you know, the, the ability to have a micro-reactor on a remote mine site then powers the, the community in the town. Yeah. It allows you to, to, to treat water out of bore, you know, uh, that's, that's uh, through desalination type plants. Uh, you can put hydrogen next to it and make some electrolyzers and fuel cells. There's a whole bunch of things you can, district heat, not so much a problem in Australia where it's, it doesn't get, well, Melbourne it gets cold. But. Yep, sure does. <laughs> Um, Guy, last question. Uh, you've been surveying this space for a while and that lends itself to you seeing broadly everything that's going on. Mm -hmm. One of the questions that we like to ask is about your view from the top. What is the insight that you've gained over the time that you've been watching this space that perhaps you wouldn't have gained if you weren't watching it so closely? Yeah, I think it's just how immature the investment opportunity is. Uh, I mean, when you think about it, the the, the 50 odd companies in the sector of which less than 10 are actually producing uranium. They're producing the uranium that, that resp is responsible for 10% of the world's electricity, right? Um, it then, if you look at the decarbonisation burden, that's sort of 40% of a, of a carbon footprint reduction there in, in that nuclear 10%. The market cap of that investable sector fits inside a Fortescue or Woodside, right? It's, it's a tiny market cap. And that's the opportunity I'm seeing is that even in the last 12 months, as we've seen now four companies on the ASX uh, get into the small ordinaries index, just the, that alone has just got more institutional investor eyeballs looking at the sector. And it's amazing how many of them, when they start to actually scratch the surface and they go, wow, decarbonisation, energy security, we talk about this a lot. Um, but also the investment opportunity because it's one of the very few commodities where there's a supply deficit that's just not being fulfilled. Guy, it sounds like a very exciting space. Thanks for taking the time to have a chat with Livewire about it. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Chris.